It's either Monday or uh, Friday or Monday, I'll try to pull out the model of the compact bone I want you to study. Um, and I just put pictures of it and point at certain things that I like to talk about. It's, it's, a, it's a good review. Okay. The osteon is shown in those two in a few ways. When you, when you slice bone and you just kind of look at it, there's one osteon. Okay. And then if you pull the layers out, it kind of looks like that. So those are all pictures of osteon. And so, um, but notice that there's like these like layers of bone here. Let me see if I can illustrate this. Out. I don't know if you can just see by looking at that picture. So say you have a central canal surrounded by lamellar bone. Fill the spaces in between the osteons, you have more lamella. So the space fillers, which is also lamellar bone, uh, I usually refer to it as interstitial lamella. You have also lamellar bone at, at the outer edge there, and it kind of arranged like like that. Long layers of bone at the circumference. So you can call that circumferential lamella. study. Notice you have circumferential lamella on either end. The outer part here, but also the inner part here. So let me draw some more circumferential lamella on this side too. More lamella. So it's in two locations and it's kind of sandwiched on either side. That circumferential lamella and that circumferential uh, lamella right here. Not to be confused with osteon, which is also lamellar bone, or interstitial lamella. It's all lamella. A closer look, um, some of these osteons, they illustrate the osteocytes with the canaliculi. And so notice how they're stuck right in between layers. So if you want to put a little lacuna, if you want to like draw one, say right there, with the osteocyte in it, I'll draw a little sp spiny looking draw one. Osteocytes with lacuna. They illustrate some of them with the osteocytes inside the lacuna with the canaliculi, but some of them they just leave empty spaces. So that got cut off. It's just lacuna if it's just the empty space. But if they illustrate something in there, the living cell is the osteocytes with canaliculi. So what I drew in blue is osteocyte with canaliculi. Clear. 
I think the other things I, I talked about, um, I talked about the central canal. An alternate name, I tend to use central canal. If you ever see the term haversion canal, it is the same thing, just a different name for the same thing. You should know that too, it comes up a lot when we teach this class. And so there's labels on, labels off. If you look at the side of this model, um, it shows how the blood vessels perforate and go up and down the central canal. So the central canal, I already pointed to one there, it goes completely vertical. Pretend there's a, um, say this one, it goes completely vertical. And inside is a blood vessel. There's, there's blood vessels, there's nerves, there's lymphatics, there's other things too. They illustrate one artery in there. So the, perpen the one that goes well, up and down in the same orientation as the column, the osteon, that's the central or herversion canal, which is already labeled. But yet you have some that got, kind of go at a, that perforate from side to side. And those are called perforating canals or Volkmann's canal. So we draw a little outshoot. Um, going this way, going that way, say. Oops. The little branch goes. They're going through the layers of uh, lamellar bone there. They perforate the layers of bone from side to side and call those ones perforating canal. We have another model of bone. It's called the Muller Muller Ward model, and in, in this they, they don't show you as much. They get a little more details there. I've kind of like um, they have their own labeling system, so I kind of look at it and I kind of call it what we refer to it as lecture. I mean, all of these are five, but what do you think you're referring to? And they make them different colors, just so you can see how many layers there are. They call them haversion lamella because they surround this whole thing with the central canal. So these are the osteocytes, right? They color them blue, but they color the canaliculi red to symbolize that they're receiving blood from the artery and it's like seeping through the cracks. But really those are um, extensions of the cell. So they got five and six and 10 there. So five is the, just the lamella from the osteon, but six is where I kind of illustrated it as on here, the interstitial lamella. <clears throat> 10, that little space there, and the space lacuna. If you don't see a cell there, don't call it osteocyte, call it lacuna. All right, so these are the um, contents of the central canal the big blue one, vein, artery, <clears throat> lymphatics, uh, that's a nerve vessel. So if you look at the side of this model, <clears throat> they show the cells on the side, and that's the, um, the cell, the osteocyte, aids the lacuna with the um, canaliculi, perforating from those spaces. They're all kind of interconnected Remember, this is a calcified inorganic matrix, so you can see how the blood seeps everywhere so all the tissues can receive blood supply. Um, let's start to talk about the bone coverings, the periosteum and osteum. In this picture of a long bone, they peel away, well, the, they section the bone completely so you can see the inside. You can see the spongy bone, the compact bone on the outside. You can see the medullary cavity, the yellow marrow. Here's where they peel off the periosteum. The periosteum is the outer edge. Here's a model, the same model, and you can see that the outer periosteum has two layers. It's a bilayer. 
I say on the slide, the outer layer is the fibrous tough layer. Fibrous, I'll describe it as a tough connective tissue. However, the inner layer, um, it's referred to as um, osteogenic. This is where you have osteoblasts that'll build um, more layers of bone if you need it to strengthen bone. Inner osteogenic. two distinct layers of the periosteum. However, the endosteum is kind of an incomplete layer. And so this picture kind of like show you what you're talking about here. Let me erase my picture here. see here in the endosteum, this incomplete layer of cells. Sometimes there's a little gap in there. <clears throat> so whereas the periosteum is bilayered, it's the outer covering. It covers the outer compact bone. Let me put that here. <coughs> it covers outer Compact bone. I mentioned it before. It helps where um, the muscles insert, helps form the joint capsules. The endosteum covers the inner spongy bone. Now, the inner spongy bone, this endosteum, it's an incomplete layer. They have some osteoblasts, maybe an osteoprogenitor cell, and osteoclast. So basically, it's osteoblast, osteoclast. So you're either building bone or breaking it down from the inside. An incomplete layer of. Osteoblasts, osteoclasts, that's basically it. So a picture of the endosteum is shown there. The gray tissue on that photograph is the endosteum. Okay? It's, it's, the in, it's the inner part where you have the medullary cavity. There is some spongy uh, trabecular bone there. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention. Back it up, back it up, back it up. It's right here. Note the Sharpie's fibers, because they help. Um, if you were to remove the periosteum, this is what I got to cut. They, they literally insert themselves into layers of bone, so they stick really well. Sharpie's fibers, I'll just add that to you. Now, the other thing we talked about before the break was that the uh, uh, metaphysis before it uh, fuses is a growth plate. And we typically teach um, the, the zones within that growth plate so students can learn how long bones get longer. And um, why before you're um, an adult, one long bone is technically three bones two epiphysis and a diaphysis, because there's a gap right there. So technically, that's two bones, even though we name it one bone. But you can see the big gap of the growth plate there. And if you were to look at that, what you would see is this cellular arrangement of zones. And those are the zones I want you to study. 
And we could look at the histology to see what's happening with the chondrocytes as they ossify. So in this figure, you have the cartilage cells at the top. As long as you have cartilage, your bones are going to get longer and you'll continue to grow taller, which is desirable usually. At the bottom, th these are the cells, that's, well, it's the ossification zone. Cartilage, uh, bone forming. It's like you're chasing these young cells at the top. Eventually, these will catch up. And once these cells at the top become calcified, you stop growing. That's bony fusion. But as long as there's young cells at the top here, you'll continue to get taller and taller and taller, okay? Until um, the hormonal changes make it so the calcification is too fast and eventually you calcify everything. That top zone where the cartilage cells are, the proliferation zone. What's proliferating? The cartilage cells. They're undergoing mitosis. So what you want to look for in that top zone, it, you see those like, um, like these little lacuna, and they got cells inside of them. Those are the chondrocytes or cartilage cells. Kind of look like that. These vertical rows of cartilage cells. That's what they look like when they've just undergone mitosis. Okay. To rapidly divide and you get these vertical rows of uh, the chondrocytes. So in the zone right, um, right under, these are the older cells. And when uh, cells get older, they've enlarged. And that's kind of right before they die. So associate hyper, hypertrophic cells with cells that are large that are about to die. That, that's what you have there, number two, hypertrophic zone. I'll say enlarged cartilage cells. Oh, they're, they're still alive. They're, they're about to die. They become calcified. So that's the next zone, the, the calcification zone. When the matrix becomes calcified, the cartilage cells, um, uh, they, they die off. And so that cartilage matrix, it deteriorates. Three calcification zone. I'll say the matrix calcifies. Cartilage cells die. The matrix, it disintegrates. And that bottom zone is the ossification zone. And that's where the new bone forms. Okay, let's see here. Complete.
complete this for classification. So just think of the cartilage cells, they're being chased by the ossification zone, okay? And eventually it catches up. But that, that process, these zones, is, is what we call the bone growth. It's longitudinal growth of bone, where long, long bones get longer. It replace, it's the replacement of cartilage with bones at the epiphyseal ends, right at that junction. So, not to be confused with bone remodeling, where you break down bone and then just kind of like deposit it somewhere else. Um, Remodeling bone isn't necessarily, the bone is not necessarily getting longer. Okay, but, so, but this is. So this process here describes longitudinal bone growth. If you want to title this. Long bones get longer. Remember, this is, these are the events of the growth plate that we talked about, that hyaline cartilage at the growth plate at the, the junction of diaphysis and epiphysis. Okay, that's this process there. So, so the picture kind of like illustrates the difference between um, longitudinal bone growth and bone remodeling. So, Yeah, point the key things out here. As the bone grows in length, uh, remodeling or resorption maintains the bone shape. So here's our, our, our epiphyseal plate. Here's our articular cartilage, which does not participate in any kind of bone growth. Um, so what they do is they show a long bone getting longer because that's being ossified. They also show Remodeling. Here, here's the outline of the old bone. So let's say you break it down and redeposit it. Maybe you put more bone here above it, and maybe you put more bone here, okay? To, um, and they call that appositional growth. So let me uh, note that. I think you should note that. So this is longitudinal bone growth. Now let me erase the board. Different kind of bone growth is appositional growth. First, you break it down, that's resorption. Then deposit it somewhere else. Absorption deposit. Here, you can see um, the old outline. They, they've thickened the diaphysis. It's strengthened the shaft in this example. So you deposit it to increase the strength of the diaphysis. Take home message here. You're, you're uh, making your bones stronger with appositional growth. You're not getting longer, you're getting stronger. Physical activity increases the likelihood you'll have stronger bones. And I have a couple of YouTube links here. You can watch uh, videos of it if you like. But um, bone remodeling, uh, one of the goals is when you break the bone down, you're keeping blood calcium homeostasis levels. When you're at homeostasis, I say good. Okay, but you could go have an imbalance one way or the other. If you have high blood calcium, say you eat leafy green vegetables, which are rich in calcium, um, or, or dairy, you know, milk has a lot of calcium too, but I think the greafy, leafy green vegetables are more healthy. Well, anyways, so you ingest that food, your blood calcium goes high. Note the hormone calcitonin, okay, because that hormone 
will increase the activity of the osteoblast, and that's the physiology you need to know. So you can have more deposition of uh, calcium. So to get this imbalance, an imbalance isn't always a bad thing. For example, eat greens, that's a good thing. The greens have lots of calcium in it. That increases blood calcium. So the hormone that kind of brings the blood calcium back to homeostasis is calcitonin. So calcitonin, it comes from a gland in the neck called the thyroid. And what that will do, it will target the osteoblasts to increase their activity. If blood calcium is low, and you want to raise it, um, the hormone is PTH. So what are some causes of low blood calcium? I don't know, maybe you're, um, for whatever reason, decrease calcium absorption from gut. Maybe you're low on vitamin, vitamin D. Vitamin D helps absorb this from the gut. For whatever reason, you're malnourished. Maybe you have low vitamin D. That, that would cause a, a decrease in blood calcium. So you want to raise it. So the hormone, uh, it's parathyroid hormone. I'm just going to abbreviate it PTH. And that hormone, we'll learn more about it in 431. It's a hormone secreted by the parathyroid hormone. It's right next to it. It's just like literally these little nodules stuck posteriorly in this same gland. Parathyroid gland. Parathyroid. So that's the endocrine gland. That hormone, what it will do is it'll make the osteoblast activity decrease and the osteoclast activity will increase. Increase osteoclast activity. Remember, these are the cells that break down the bone. That will correct the imbalance. So in either way, you're depositing the bone. You're, you're, excuse me. You're depositing the calcium into the bone to decrease it. And put that as a result of this one. When this cell activity is increased, you have this kind of net deposition. Okay. Net calcium deposition. If this is the um, activity, you have net calcium resorption. So you'll, you'll increase the blood levels because you're liberating it from the inorganic matrix and it, it's available to the bloodstream. Net calcium absorption. Okay, that's what I wanted to say. Well, anyways, those are the board notes, and here's a figure that can kind of walk you through it. Just hormonally, this is how the body maintains blood calcium levels. That was one of the skeletal uh, functions that I talked about at the beginning of class. Okay, so associate these notes with that picture. The other thing you should do is understand that mechanical load also influences uh, bone remodeling. And that basically, this is activity level in your life. And more is good. So basically, there's not, it's not a strict um, imbalance. It's just like we always encourage uh, students to increase activity level, in increase your exercise, your weight-bearing exercises, because it'll cause your bones to hypertrophy, making for strong bone.
influence of mechanical load on bone remodeling. Mechanical load is, think of that as weight-bearing exercises. Like uh, jogging, right? Because you're on your feet, and you're running on the earth. Swimming is not, because you're buoyant in the water. I mean, it's great physical activity, but it's not considered weight bearing. Um, cross country skiing, if you live in that area. Anything where you're, you're, bo you're on your body and you're just moving through space is considered weight bearing. The effect is your bone, or your bone hypertrophies. What you're doing is you're creating these little micro uh, tears in the bone tissue, and the osteoblasts fill the gaps, and you're, and you're increasing your um, appositional growth there. So, Think of this as uh, when you're younger, in your teens and 20s, and your uh, activity level is high, you're putting money in the bank, right? Your savings account, you don't touch it. Because when you get older and your activity level decreases, you don't have time to exercise. Or you have a job where you're very sedentary, you're sitting in a cubicle all day. Uh, your bone atrophies. We, in class, classes like this, we usually talk about astronauts. They live in zero G. There's no weight. There's, and so you worry about their bones wasting away. Um, or if you're injured, you have a back injury, you're, you're instructed to just lie in bed, bed rest. Okay, you can't like get on your feet. You worry about atrophy. Or a decreased activity level, maybe due to bed rest. Maybe it's just, you're like a couch potato. We, we say sedentary <coughs> lifestyle. That, that's our euphemism for you're a couch potato. You, you don't exercise ever. Uh, sedin, sedentary lifestyle. Most organizations recommend about 30 minutes of exercise on most days of the week. Okay, so what is that like? Three, three and a half hours. Uh, so if you're kind of under that, you're kind of below the recommended guidelines. But and we start to consider you in this category where that can happen. And the clinical manifestation of that is uh, osteoporosis. So let's see here. Let's talk about bone loss with age. With age, the efficiency of osteoblasts declines. So the question becomes, what age? 30, 30 years. That's when, you, that's when it's like start to go downhill. The rate of bone formation decreases. It's less than the rate of bone resorption, okay? Because your osteoblasts, their, their level of activity is declining. The result of that you have this net deficit of bone deposition. So your bones start to show this loss of bone mineral density or excessive bone atrophy. And that can be measured on um, imaging technology. It's BMD. BMD can be quantitated. by imaging. Low BMD is a concern. Yeah, that's a thing there. The clinical manifestation of low BMD, it could be osteoporosis. 
So osteoporosis is a condition, or what I say is the clinical manifestation of bone atrophy. It, it could result in what's called low trauma fractures. So I'll just add, this is a concern for osteoporosis. Just um, think of that term as meaning, well, what, what does it mean to be porous? Brittle bone. Okay, there's less bone density, and the bone you got is brittle. And you can see the picture there to illustrate that, that concept. And the result could be what are called low trauma fractures. So the, that, that's why we worry about it, because you fall down and you break your hip. That's, that's bad news. So this is kind of like increased risk for what are called low trauma fractures. Low trauma means, um, well, let's say a young person falls down. They get right back up. Maybe they have a scrape or something. An, old per an elderly person falls down. They break their hip. That's traumatic, but it didn't take much for that to happen. They just fell down. I mean, what's the deal? It could be they have osteoporotic bone. The most common breaks in weak bones are wrist, spine, hip. There's a couple of types of osteoporosis. There's type 1 and type 2. So type 1 is associated with menopause. So menopause, that's um, females, elderly women. The average age of menopause is about 50.5 years. When we take repro, I talk more about it. Well, menopause is um, every month a sexually fertile woman has an ovulation. Okay, um, That could be fertilized by sperm for reproduction. Menopause is a, a depletion of those eggs. You stop ovulating. Now, with that, um, postmenopausal women, they lose like estrogens, and estrogens seem to like influence the osteoblasts. So um, you have accelerated specular bone loss. So you see increased incidence of wrist fractures, hip fractures. They're called collies wrist fractures, if you want to write that term down. The term I uh, use quite a bit. So 15 to 20 years postmenopause, you start to see this. You may see increase in, well, I'll just call them fragility fractures, the wrist, the hip, the spine. Collies, hip, in the spine, in the in the backbones, um, the big body part of the vertebra, it tends to like like wedge in. And they're called wedge fractures. So call, remember, collies is wrist. I showed you that picture in the beginning. Uh, this is uh, a wedge fracture. That's the type one. The type two. It's just age-related, men or women. Um, typically, age 70 years or older. To be technical, um, we don't use the term old. We use the term elderly. And it refers to people 65 or older. So in the elderly, age 70, this is kind of what we see. See it in men or women. This low BMD with, uh, with osteoporotic bone due to age, not necessarily menopause. Although, if you do the math, 
It's about the same age. So this is age related. Around 70 years, and you may see the same type of thing, the same type of fragility fractures. stop here. We don't have time for lab today. I'll give you some more time later. I wanted to give some time to uh, pass back your uh, lab practicals if you wanted to see that. We had all your old labs over there. If you haven't taken your old labs over there, uh, please do so. I I'm not going to keep them for you. I'll just kind of toss them and recycle them. Um, but if you'd like to see your lab practicals, stick around. If not, you're dismissed. See you Friday.